Good evening, and welcome to Study the Bible for a Change. I, uh, I th sound is a little hot. Thank you, sir. I th think we're broadcasting around the world, so welcome to those of you who are joining us via the live stream. Uh, this is the third of our Know Your Bible seminars, the third and final one. Uh, we've done one every two weeks for the last uh, six weeks now, so this is our last four weeks, I should say, so this is the last one. Tonight we're going to talk about what is one of the most important but neglected aspects of the Christian life, and that is studying the Bible. More specifically, we're talking about Studying the Bible for a Change. Now, I should let you know that I borrowed this title from Ray Lubeck, who is my professor at Multnomah University, before it was a university, uh, and he wrote a book that is titled, Read the Bible for a Change. So I thought, well, this is a great concept, that when we study the Bible, we're not just studying it because it's interesting, we study it because we want to be transformed by God's Word. Um, much of the material that I'm going to share tonight is, is similar to the material that many Bible college students will receive uh, as they take an inductive Bible study course. And so this is just a, a very similar course that we're, we're taking tonight as if you were a, a college student, a Bible college student, or a seminary student. But underlying tonight's presentation is the recognition that we live in a culture that is more Bible illiterate than ever before. In fact, it's, it's something that I found interesting. I love to read the classics. And if you read classic literature, whether it's Tolstoy or Dickens, uh, you're going to find a lot of references to Scripture. And I've heard... English professors today bemoaning the fact that college students don't get the many references to Scripture uh, that are found in the classics, whereas in years past, the authors assumed that everyone had a basic knowledge of Scripture, but it's not true today. Uh, beyond this, there is an inundation of our culture by information. We are information overloaded. And most of the information that we're receiving is not soul nourishing. What if I told you that I was going to begin a new diet? You'd say, good job, Dan. That's good. Go on a diet. That's great. And my new diet is going to be made up of Skittles and Fruit Loops. What would you say? <laughs> you would probably think I'm crazy uh, for going on such a diet. You wouldn't think it was so wise. But isn't that, in essence, the diet of most people's souls today. I mean, in essence, we are cramming our bodies with Skittles and Fruit Loops. All this information, all of this content that is not nutritious, that does not enrich our souls, that does not build us up or strengthen us. And so tonight, we are, we are working to remedy that. Uh, in a small way. Now, I know most of the people who are uh, with us tonight, either present here uh, in person or via online, most of you actually uh, have more of a diet than Skittles and Fruit Loops when it comes to the content that you're taking in. And yet, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that there is a problem. And I appreciate this diagram and maybe we could get the rear projector turned on so that I could see that. Uh, oh, and the, make sure I'm clicking. Get the clicker working for me here. There we go. I, I think this diagram is interesting uh, because it's a takeoff on the concept of the food pyramid. And all of us saw the food pyramid growing up. Well, we, I should ask you, Dirk, was there a food pyramid when you were growing up? Okay, okay, yeah, all right. That was in the 1700s, so we're good. Um, but uh, the food pyramid uh, is the idea that you need a lot of certain kinds of foods that are healthier for you, vegetables, fruits, etc., and you need less of the things that are less beneficial to you. And so 
I love the fact that this author, his name's Brett McCracken, and I honestly have no familiarity with him other than these pictures. When I saw this concept of what he calls the wisdom pyramid, I believe that's actually the name of his book. But it takes its cue from the food pyramid. But consider for a moment what your soul diet looks like. Doesn't it look... uh, Does it look much like what this author recommends? That's the question. So you see it here. The Bible is the foundation of this pyramid, and it's what you're taking in the most of. Next up, we see fellowship with the body of Christ, and then God's creation. These three things are are the main main components of the nutritional intake that uh, this man is recommending where wisdom is found. As you go higher, you have books, you have entertainment, then you have social media. What he argues, and I think it's true, is that in our culture, we have inverted this pyramid. That people take in, more than anything else, entertainment and social media. That would be the the main level of most people's soul nourishment pyramid and that their intake of God's word would be the very smallest portion of their life. And so I guess as we begin here, maybe a good question just for you to ponder is, if you were to work up a pyramid of your actual intake, what would it look like? Would the Bible be at the bottom? Would that be the most significant in church and God's creation? Uh, Or would books and entertainment and social media be the largest chunk of your pyramid. And so we take a, a look here, and uh, I'd still love to see if we get the rear. Pr- okay. Uh, and so if you look on this pyramid, you can see uh, a little more explanation. So local church tradition, embodied rhythms and worship. Embodied can sound like a strange word. It's disembodied sounds strange, but embodied simply means we're here present, like you are here tonight. We're, we're actually in the flesh, present with other people, worshiping on a regular basis. Rhythms means it's a regular basis. It's, it's not once in a while. It's a weekly gathering of God's people. Wise people in physical place, meaning you're engaging with other people who are wise, who are pursuing godly wisdom uh, and, and you're in proximity with them. On the other side, time-tested theology. Uh, we believe that the Word of God is our authority, right? Um, but it's also important that you're part of a congregation that holds to an understanding of the Word of God that is in line with the traditions of historic Christianity because we know people can take things out of context from this book. And so that's what it's talking about, uh, uh, an understanding of God's word that's in line with historic Christianity, wise people in Christian history, and that there's a continuity to our faith. Even though, uh, you know, we're here today, we count ourselves as part of a larger church. First of all, the Retton Gospel Network here in the city of Retton, all gospel preaching churches in our area, we're, we're part of that fellowship. Then we expand wider to all people around the world who love God's word and understand that we are saved by grace through faith. But then we carry this, not just with us, but we can go back century after century after century and track with those who've believed this same thing, who who were part of this same story. And so these, these are the foundations of a healthy, nourishing life. Those who are engaged in nourishing engagement with the Bible, with the church, nature and beauty, I... You know, God's, we we talk about um, natural revelation and supernatural revelation. This is a supernatural kind, but natural revelation is also a place where you can see the reality of God's existence, and there are a number of scriptures that could back that up, that we experience God there. And as you move up, there there are good books. Uh, By the way, it's great to read, we were just having this conversation with someone recently, it's good to read Christian literature. Um, that feeds your soul. There's a lot of great authors God has gifted that may not be in the Bible, but many of these books are Bible-saturated or reflect well uh, the truths of Scripture, the Bible story. Um, There are other books that may not be quite as beneficial, and so you want to have a little less of that content coming into your life. Uh, 
Um, and then, of course, again, we see up above, uh, really, you could put entertainment, internet, social media, all those things up there, of which we all know that there's a lot of garbage. It's, it's, uh, it's like sometimes finding a needle in a haystack to find beneficial things there. So you have to be careful. You have to be wary about what you're taking in. Um, and so this is the basic concept that we're talking about tonight as we back out a little bit. The point is we need healthy, nourishing input in our lives if we are to grow to be healthy, nourished individuals on a spiritual level. So how do we reorient our lives so that God's word is our primary source of soul feeding? Certainly we can benefit from preachers, you know, gathering each week with God's people. It's a good way to nourish your soul or maybe uh, Christian authors or speakers. But that may only account for an hour on Sunday morning or an hour here or there throughout the week. Uh, So is it possible for us to nourish ourselves throughout the week, to, to on a daily basis engage with God's word in a way that is soul nourishing? And the answer is yes. In fact, I would take a step further and say not only is it possible for us to nourish ourselves, I would say that it's the expectation of New Testament authors that we are nourishing ourselves, that we're growing in the word. I think of 1 Corinthians 3, where Paul says to the church in Corinth, Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? And so he uses the analogy that all of us understand, no matter what century or millennium you were born into, that a baby begins with milk. And so here's what he's saying. He said, you were babies in the faith, so I gave you milk. But now it's time to grow up. Uh, In fact, Hebrews then takes it a step further. The book of Hebrews chapter 5, another very similar quote, verses 11 to 14 The author says, we have much to say about this. It's talking about a specific teaching. He says, but it's hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness The solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Now, I always date myself when I share this presentation because every time I read this passage, I think of the old Christian song, Just a Fat Little Baby. And I think, honestly, this is what the author of Hebrews is thinking of. He's saying, y'all are just fat babies who can only drink milk By this time, you should be eating solid food. In fact, he's kind of giving us a picture here of adults in Christ who are walking around with baby bottles in their mouths. And he's saying, it's time to give up the bottle. You need solid food. You need to grow in your faith. And so that's really what tonight is about. It's giving us the tools so that we can learn from God's word ourselves. We can feed ourselves. Now, within this room, there are people at all different levels when it comes to your ability to study God's Word. Some of you are very confident when it comes to Bible study. Some of you are not so much. But tonight, no matter your confidence, you're going to walk away with some great tools that will assist you in the process. Uh, Those of you who have maybe done a little more Bible study, you'll maybe be refined a little bit in your understanding of how to use these tools. Um, For all present, we're going to walk away with a greater ability to avoid some of the pitfalls that we often fall into in the way that we study God's Word, not to mention a more concrete method for doing that. So there are four basic steps in the Bible study process, specifically the inductive Bible study process. And those steps begin with studying the Bible. First step is observation. Now, to observe something means to notice it. 
to watch it, to pay careful attention to something. So when it comes to Bible study, you begin by carefully reading the text, looking for specific clues as to its meaning. But we have to ask the question before we even jump into what observation is, is, is observation important? And the reason I ask this question is because I believe it's unbelievably important, but I also believe it's unbelievably neglected. And so two points to make here. One, observation is the foundational element. All Bible study begins with observation. Now, I want to ask you a question, those of you who are here tonight. Where in our culture do we rely on observation? Anyone have any ideas? Where in our culture is observation important? Driving, right? Driving is unbelievably important. In fact, uh, now that my son is driving a motorcycle, uh, we become unbelievably aware that someone driving a motorcycle has to be twice as observant as someone driving a regular car because you have to pay attention to all the drivers around you and what they're doing. Have they noticed you, that you're, there's a motorcycle driving beside them? You don't want to be in their blind spot. You have to be extremely observant. Um, there's probably any other areas where you need to be observant, where it's important in culture? Everywhere. I'm thinking of jobs. I'm thinking like a crime scene investigator, right? A crime scene investigator uh, is someone who, who has to observe and ideally, anyone in, in the law, we want them to be very observant. We want them to observe. We don't want them to come with, their, with, their, uh, with conclusions already made up in their mind, right? We don't want them to walk into the crime scene and say, oh, I know who did it. It's this guy. No, no. We want them to read the scene and observe it carefully and come to conclusions based upon what the scene shows them and Really, when you are studying the Word of God, you're doing the same thing. It's the same way. If you come to a text, a Bible passage, and say, oh, I already know what this is about. I, I know this. This is what he's talking about. Uh, that can be hazardous to your health, or at least to the nourishment of your soul, because it's easy for us to read into a text something that is not there. And, so, and the other thing about it is, if you start off on the wrong foot... It can lead you astray the rest of the way. Observation is the foundational element. So again, with the crime scene investigator, if they come into a scene and say, well, I know it's the butler did it in the study with the, anyway. You know, they can already come in with their, pre and that's going to take them through the rest of the way. They'll keep going that direction, and the end result will be they're way off if they don't start their observations correctly. And same is true with the Word of God. We've got to do the work of observation at the beginning if we're going to have something that resembles the truth of God's Word at the end. Because that's our goal. We want to understand what God's Word is actually saying. We don't want to read into it. So we also call this the indispensable element, observation. Any significant observation you miss will skew the rest of your Bible study. Now, have any of you ever watched a series of The Amazing Race? Anyone out here? Anyone? Anyone? Just my wife. My wife and I, this, I'm not even sure if you call this um, reality TV. I was reading something and it was calling it something different. But if it is reality TV, it's the only reality TV we like because, you know, some of them just, it's all about drama but on this, you know, you just, you're trying to accomplish a goal. You're trying to win this game. However, what makes this, this show dramatic, you don't have to create it. What makes it dramatic, and this is the way they do it, is they, they put little caveats when you have to do, accomplish something. They put rules in there that you have to read, and usually they're not hidden. You just need to pay attention. But if you don't pay attention to the clue, and this is what happens over and over again in The Amazing Race, somebody gets knocked out because they didn't read just a basic part of the clue. And then you'll see them, they'll be doing the wrong thing for hours, they can't figure it out. And then they say, well, maybe we should read the clue again. And then when they read the clue, they figure it all out. Basically, with observation, what we're saying is, you need to read the clues, if you want to understand God's word, you need to understand, you need to read what's in 
God's word. We fail to understand a passage if we don't make careful observations. For this reason, it is very important that you give ample time to observing the passage you are studying. So, let's get to it. How do you make observations? Well, there are some key observation questions that we're going to look at. We're going to use the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 10 to 21, as an example as we do this tonight. And we're going to go pretty quickly through this passage but just to give you an idea of some of the different things you can observe in a text. And you may remember John 3, 10 to 21 is the story of Jesus with Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. And Jesus is telling him uh, about what salvation looks like. Um, And of course, this is a passage that we see, for God so loved the world. John 3.16, that he gave his one and only son. So we're very familiar with this passage. So let's look just a few questions that you could answer to begin with about um, this passage. What kind of literature is it? Well, there are two aspects to that. Oh, I'm going to back up. Uh, It is the type of literature is narrative. This is narrative literature. Uh, and, And the genre that we find it in is gospel. Now, I'm not going to go into detail here. We're not going to, I'm not going to tell you all the different kinds because, honestly, these observation questions have importance, um, but they're not the most important questions that we need to look at. Um, these are kind of foundational elements here. So who's the author? Well, in this case, we believe it's John because of uh, references within the text. Uh, audience. First century Jews and Gentiles, some books are more, might be more Jewish focused, some more might be more focused towards Gentiles, like a lot of Paul's uh, writings are a little more focused towards Gentiles, but a book like Hebrews has a great focus on the Old Testament, so it may more likely have a Hebrew audience. Um, Setting. And by the way, these are things you can do with any book, right? These are just basic elements of any book. Uh, John 2.13 tells us Jerusalem is where this is taking place. So the setting of this story is in Jerusalem. The tone, you could say, is pedantic. So it's like teaching a child. This is Jesus teaching Nicodemus. He's teaching him kind of like you teach a child. Here's, let me give you some instruction on what salvation looks like uh, according to the word of God. Uh... The plot, again, it's Jesus teaching a Pharisee. The gospel is basically what's happening here. And then the characters, of course, we know the characters. It's Nicodemus, it's Pharisees, and it's Jesus. Now, all these questions have significance toward the end of deepening our understanding of the passage. But the next few questions are, without a doubt, the most important questions in observing a passage. And these are all the questions that are so significant because the answers are all found right there in that immediate passage. You can find the answers to these questions. So what you're doing as you're reading John 3, 10 through 21, if this was your text that you're studying, you will do, first of all, you'll be looking for themes. What themes are repeated? And in this specific passage, some of the themes that are significant are eternal life, believing in the Son, and rejection of the truth or the light. So here are some basic themes. So when you're doing your study, as you begin reading, you want to be writing down, okay, here are some themes I see as I'm writing. Uh, And a theme is different than individual words, because that's also an important aspect of your observation. And and by the way, uh, it, it may seem kind of strange to you to do this, but If you count words while you're writing down, if you observe, say, wow, believe or believed or believes occurs seven times in this small passage. Seven times. Well, that tells you that this is an important aspect of what this passage is about. And that later on, when you write an interpretation, it better reflect something to do with believing right? Or the the word son is found five times. The word world is found five times in this passage. But so as you're writing down on your piece of paper, or you can do this on a computer, uh, you can record the themes that, and I usually attach them to verses. So I know what verse I'm talking about. So I go, well, in this verse, in John 3.16, 
we have the theme eternal life. It's present here. Um, but you can also then say, okay, well, where else is life found? And you can record the different verses that the word life is found in this passage. The words and the themes that are repeated in a passage give you a good idea of what the author is talking about. And they help to keep you from going astray because they're kind of like guidelines. Oh, th- this, this is what he's repeated, so obviously this is what I should be paying attention to. And it also keeps us from reading into a text things that aren't there. If you're writing down an interpretation and there's no words that reflect what you're saying, well, then maybe the way you're interpreting it is incorrect. Maybe you're reading into it something that wasn't actually there. A third very important aspect of observation is references. And I've said this many times before. I know many of you have study Bibles. This is a NIV study Bible, and you can't see it from the distance, small type, but about a third of the page is taken up with commentary discussing the different things that are found on this page. Now, that commentary is fine, but it's not authoritative, is it? This is just some human being's idea of what he thinks this text means. And that's fine to read that. But when you're observing a text for yourself, I encourage you to avoid the commentaries and instead let the text speak for itself. But but one of the tools that I think is important, if you're going to do Bible study, the tool you need, and in my Bible it's found in the center column, is references. You want to be able to find the cross-references. And I caution you that just because two passages sound similar, sometimes this is also an interpretive decision, right? The, those who edit the, the, pas- the, the Bible may say, well, this passage sounds like this passage over here. But that doesn't necessarily mean that this author wants you to be thinking of this passage over here. And that's what you're really trying to get at, is what does this author expect me to understand when he makes a reference, and I, I used this example uh, recently, uh, for example, in First Peter, there's a reference, to, uh, Peter refers to God's people as uh, not loved, or those who have not received mercy, and those who are now not my people, but now are the people of God. Now, if you know your Old Testament, you know that the author expects you to see that this is referencing Hosea, where Hosea's children were actually named not my people, and not loved. So this is an example of a reference that's very important. You need to make sure and catch, or else you're not going to get the meaning of that text. And by the way, with references, we always want to work backwards. So we always, obviously, if I'm reading a a novel, a classic by Charles Dickens, and I'm in chapter 30, and I'm trying to understand something about the character in chapter 30, I don't jump to chapter 55 to understand it, do I? I work backwards because it's a story. So I go back to say, okay, what did he say about this character? The same way in scripture, we're always looking backwards in terms of references, in terms of understanding what the text is saying. And then the fourth thing that I'll mention here is spikes. And this, if you were here this morning, I referenced this in my sermon because a, a spike is basically a phrase or a sentence that sticks out as important to the bigger story of God. A phrase or a sentence that sticks out as important to the bigger story of God. Now certainly, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Well, this is a spike because we see that God, for example, we go to Isaiah 52 and 53 where we see the picture of the suffering servant who's going to die for the iniquity or the sins of others. So this is a theme that's been carried on throughout the story of God. In fact, you can go even further back to the sacrificial system. So when we come across a theme like that, we call it a spike. And let me just once again reiterate, uh, I always like the the lie detector test as my example because we've all seen it on the movies, I trust. I don't know, maybe some of us have had a lie detector test, but we've all seen it. And the spikes come up and down, but if there's something significant, it goes just like that. That's a, that's a spike, is when it shoots up really high. And so when you're reading God's word and you come across a topic that we see throughout God's word that's an important topic in scripture, that's a spike. That's where you go, oh, this is important. I need to write this down. And so 
an example of that, like I said, would be for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Well, that's a spike. That's something that's significant. The sacrifice of a son can take you back to the suffering servant of Isaiah 52 and 53. So here in a nutshell is, are the important aspects of observing the text for the sake of inductive Bible study. This is the most important task, is, is the time you spend, before you start writing down anything about what you think it means, you're first observing and saying, okay, what themes are significant in this passage? What are the repeating words? Does it make specific references back to previous scripture that the author expects you to understand? And are there any spikes? Is there anything that sticks out as well? This is really important in the continuity of the bigger story of God. Let me pause here for a second. We're going to actually look into some more examples a little later, but let me pause here and ask, are there any questions about this initial aspect, this first step in the inductive Bible study process, observation? Questions? And also, if you're joining us online, you're welcome to go ahead and type your question into the chat there on YouTube. Anyone? We've got it all. Deb, feel free to interrupt me if you see something pop up on our chat. Okay, we'll, we'll get into examples in a few moments, but I want to move on to the second step. So after you've done a good job of observing what's in the text, just reading the text carefully, that's all we're talking about. Reading it carefully over and over again is good. If it's a small text, you can read through it a few times and write down what you see in that passage. Then it's time for you... Oh, I, and I did, I have one added here that wasn't on my original notes, I need to add that, uh, is questions. That's the other great thing to do at this point during observations. Any questions that you have of the text? Now, I actually need to restate that. The questions you're seeking to ask are not necessarily the questions you come with. You want to ask the questions that the passage itself wants you to ask. For example, someone might be coming along and read John 3, 16, where it says, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And you may say, well, that makes me wonder, what about the people who never had a chance to hear the gospel? What about them? You know, that's a great question. But that's not a question that this passage is asking you to ask. Do you understand? It's not in this passage. That's not a concern of the author. And so you want, when, when you're doing the observations, the kind of questions we're looking for here are not just whatever pops up into your head, but what question does the text make you ask? For example, you might ask, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. A question you might ask, well, how does Jesus relate to God the Father? What is that relationship like? That would be a question that would be more in line with what the text is communicating. All right. Any questions before we move on to interpretation? All right. Move on to step number two, interpreting the text. And let's define interpretation here. Interpretation is the second step in studying the Bible, we have observation, so you observe, you interpret, you principalize, you apply. Uh, secondly, interpretation explains the meaning of words as they relate to what we already know. Now just process that for a second. Interpretation explains the meanings of words as they relate to something we already know. And so the first point, as we seek to describe this, is we cannot understand communication if we cannot relate to it. This morning in the service, I quoted some of the Shema, which is Hebrew, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Now, if you don't know Hebrew or you don't have familiarity with that statement, that will sound strange to you. In fact, I love the Gibbs as they were sharing this morning during our service they were sharing in a different language, and we didn't understand what they're saying. We can't relate to those sounds. Those sounds make no sense to us. Uh, in the same way, interpretation explains the meanings of words as they relate to what we already know. If you can't relate it to something that you already know, it's not going to make any sense to you. 
And so uh, our natural tendency is to primarily relate what we are reading to our own life experience. Think about that for a second. In fact, isn't this true in all of life? If you see something happen, you see someone say something, you see something you recognize, it's a pattern, and you go, oh, I've seen that before. I know what that means. For example, if all of a sudden the uh, vehicle behind you turns on sirens and lights, you understand what that means, don't you? This is not good. I need to either get out of the way or I'm going to be pulled over for something, right? It, you relate that to something. You have understanding of what that means. So in the same way, when we come to Scripture, we have our understanding of life that we bring to it, and we're trying to relate Scripture to what we can understand. Now, everyone does this, and we have to do this to understand everything, but the point that I'm trying to make here is that all interpretation is necessarily colored by our previous experiences. Now, to some extent, this is unavoidable. For example, I talked about this in my sermon today, that throughout Scripture we see this picture of God's love for us as a heavenly father. Well, if your experience of a father on earth was not really healthy, then you may have a hard time grasping what the love of a heavenly father looks like. You may not be able to relate to that. Um, And so you may superimpose ideas onto God that aren't there. Maybe you'll think of God as this, uh, as this uh, well, like little bunny foo-foo, you know? Little bunny foo-foo going through the forest, taking all the field mice and bopping them on the head. Maybe if you had a very authoritarian father figure, maybe you imagine that that's what God's all about. He's just waiting to bop you on the head. Is that your picture of God that you get from what you can relate to? Well, the way we change that is by reading Scripture and by adopting and accepting what Scripture says God looks like rather than what our experiences say God looks like because God is who he is regardless of who we think he is, right? So that's what we're trying to get. And the same thing is every time we read Scripture, we have the ability to read into it from our own experiences Maybe something a little more pragmatic. I remember one of the elders from our church in Minnesota, uh, great old uh, uh, carpenter uh, there in Minnesota, and a uh, man with the biggest hands I've ever seen in my life. Big, rough, thick hands for doing all the work he did. Um, but I remember we would meet for coffee at a coffee shop. And back then, especially in Marshall, Minnesota, there were just two coffee shops in town, two. And they were new. That was a new thing, a coffee shop. I mean, we know what a diner looks like. You go to the diner, but you don't go to a place just for coffee. Uh, And I remember meeting this man a handful of times at this coffee shop that served good, strong, bold roast coffee. I loved it. Finally, in one of our meetings, this man said to me, can we go to McDonald's? I hate the coffee here. But here's the point. When I told this man, hey, when I said, let's go to coffee, in my mind, I'm thinking, we go to the the coffee shop. We go to the place that serves the bold. In his mind, he's thinking, let's go to McDonald's or to the local diner. That's where you go to get coffee. The stuff that's a little weaker, uh, not quite so bold. and, and we, this happens to us all the time. And the more we live in a multicultural community, the more we have to explain ourselves. Because you may say something and they may see something totally different. The same things happen when we come to Scripture. Is we may see something in Scripture and go, oh, I know what he's talking about. I had a professor once who said, if your interpretation of a passage came very quickly and easily it's probably wrong because it comes quickly and easily when we are relating it to our own experience. It's a little harder when we're relating what the text is saying to the world of the text itself. In other words, the story of God. Um, By the way, this was another man who said that 
the little old lady in church who's been reading her Bible all her life knows better how to interpret it than the fresh seminary graduate. And now this was my professor, so he wasn't putting down his ability to teach seminary graduates. But the point he's making is, is that the more you know the world of the text, the more it's part of who you are, the better you're able to understand what it says in the small parts. And so this is a little, when we're interpreting the text, our ideal, our desire is to understand the world of the text. So let's go to number three here. Faithful interpretation intentionally relates the text to its context rather than our lives. Now think about that for a second, and it says, which is reserved for step number four, application. Faithful interpretation intentionally relates the text to its context rather than our lives. And you might say, wait a second, Dan, aren't I supposed to apply God's word to my life? Yes, you are, but not in the interpretation step. Because if you start applying it then, before you've done the hard work of really understanding what it says, then it's very easy for us to twist God's word to make it say what we think it should say or what we imagine it might say. Our goal in interpretation is not to superimpose our ideas, but to understand the text within the greater context of what's being written. And so maybe a way to understand this is if you're reading a letter that was written by your great-great-great-grandfather and there's a reference in that letter to something you can relate to in modern culture that didn't exist then. By the way, what do we call that? When, when you find something in modern culture that, in a book that's supposed to be an old in a writing, an anachronism, anachronism, because it doesn't belong in that time frame. You have to be careful not to read your own ideas back into your great, 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 great grandfather's letter because it was a different life back then. They had a different worldview. The life was so different, you need to understand the context of their world to understand what they're saying. The same is true with Scripture. Our goal is, first, to understand, to let the text speak for itself. So, our objective in interpretation is to derive the meaning of the text not from personal life experience, but by relating it to the worldview of the text itself. And you can, oh, excuse me, the world of the text itself. In other words, uh, and I've shared this many times before, as was written above the doorframe of one of my seminary classrooms, context, context, context. We must read scripture in context. Don't, under, if you don't understand what a word or phrase means as you're reading it, don't sit and brainstorm. Don't look the word up in an English dictionary, the meaning's not going to be there. I mean, if you don't understand what the word means at all, then sure, look it up in an English dictionary. But if you're really trying to understand the nuanced definition of that word, what it's trying to say, don't use an English dictionary. Don't reflect upon movies that you've seen or writings that you've read. You want to look to the text itself. The, the, the passage itself should shed insight into what it means. If you want to understand God's word, you got to look more deeply into God's word. I don't know how many times I've asked someone to tell me, well, what, is this, what does this passage mean? And a lot of times, if they have a beard, they'll go like this, look off into the distance. And I want to say, why are you looking out there? The answer's not out there. Look down. <laughs> look in, look at, read the text itself. Don't imagine what you think. I wonder what it might be saying. No, every time we have a question about the text, we need to go back to the text because the context is where we find the meaning. Uh, I want to look for just a second. For a great example of this, we find in Acts 17.11, and I know you've, if you've been in the church any length of time, you've heard this referred to. Acts chapter 17. You remember Acts is about the story of the spread of, of the church, the spread of the gospel after Jesus ascended into heaven. He sent the disciples out. And as they were out teaching various peoples, we see here the people that they reached out to in Berea. 
Acts 17, verse 10 says, As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now, scriptures here, what do you think this is referring to when it says they examined the scriptures in Acts? Anyone? It's the Old Testament, right? Because the New Testament wasn't written yet. So basically, Paul's speaking these truths, saying this is what is truth, and they're saying, okay, well, let me look in the Bible, our Bible, which is the Old Testament, and see if what you're saying is true. See if it coheres with what I have in my Bible. And likely, he's quoting Old Testament scripture, so they have something to go off and say, okay, is that, yeah, let me look and see if that's what's there. We want to be like the Bereans when we dig into the Word of God. As we seek to understand it, we don't want to look up here or imagine what we can think it might mean in our heads. We want to look in the text itself and see what the Bible itself actually says. Um, I always use an example um, because I remember it from the place Deb and I met. Deb and I met on a singing tour, the Continental Singers, and there was a line in our performance that we did at 80 different churches over the course of three months. Less than three months, we were at 80 different churches putting on this uh, Christian music presentation. And there was a quote in there from John 12, 32. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Anyone know who says that? Jesus, right? Jesus says that. Anyone know what Jesus is referring to? Now, I'll tell you, in the context of our program... We were talking about worshiping God and holding him up, hold up the light. We were talking about exalting Jesus. And so if you, if you were listening to the program, you would think that what it means there is when we exalt Jesus, he draws other to, others to himself. Now, by the way, that's a good thing. And it's true, but that's not what the passage is saying. Because what does the next verse say in John chapter 12? Verse 33, it says, he said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. In other words, when he talks about being lifted up, he's not talking about exaltation. He's talking about being lifted up on a cross, his death, that this is how he will draw all men to himself, by dying for us. So uh, that's just an example of how you can read something into a passage. You go, oh, when it says lifted up, it must mean worship. Because that's what we think of when we think of lifting Jesus up. No, that's not what it's talking about. Let the context tell you, and it'll say it's talking about Jesus dying on the cross. So, the truth is all people necessarily allow their interpretation to be jaded to some extent by personal experience. So, is there any way to minimize this pitfall? Is there any way to keep your experience from having such an impact on your interpretation so you can actually hear what God's Word says? So the question we're asking here is, how do you let, oh, I guess I, I neglected to put any of these things up. There we go. Context, 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 and John 12, 32. So how do we let the text speak for itself? Well, first of all, by immersing ourselves in the Bible, and I actually have on my notes here passage, and either one is good, but certainly the specific passage you're reading, you want to immerse yourself in it. But in general, you want to be immersing yourself in in Scripture. We talked this morning about Scripture saturation. We want to be saturated with the Word of God. Because just like we were talking about with the food pyramid example, we are already getting bombarded with all kinds of thoughts and ideas from the world that may or may not be beneficial. A lot of the time are not beneficial. What we need to do is counteract that by listening to God's word, by immersing ourselves in God's word. And I, this is a good point. I always love the navigators. I was just sharing this with someone this week, the, the hand is illustration for the navigators regarding the word of God. They said everyone should hear the word of God, should study the word of God, excuse me, hear the word of God, read the word of God, study the word of God, and memorize the word of God. Now, hearing, you could do on a Sunday morning, right? Right? Reading, 
maybe just you're reading through a book of the Bible that you do in your own, your own time. Studying, maybe you're doing that with a group of people and you have a specific passage you're studying together. Uh, memorizing, uh, we do that in our own discipleship group. I highly recommend memorizing scripture together, holding each other accountable to what you're memorizing. And number five is meditate. So you can meditate on what you hear. You can meditate on what you read from God's word. You can meditate on what you study and meditate on what you memorize. But the point is we need to grow when it comes to the intake of God's word in our lives so that more and more as we read God's word, as we study it, that it will be more and more our worldview. We, we are adopting, we begin to adopt God's worldview. It's like that little old lady in the pew who read the Bible all her life. Well, the Bible is her worldview. Uh, and that's really our goal. So, but there's two aspects that I want to focus on. One is choosing to absorb the biblical worldview philosophically. And when I say philosophically, what I'm saying here is, is making the determination then that when, when I find something in God's word that conflicts with what I think I believe, I submit to what the word says and, and I don't try to force God's word to fit my conclusions. That's what it means to philosophically choose to absorb the biblical worldview. When the biblical worldview conflicts with the culture, I say the culture is wrong, the Bible is right. So it's philosophically saying, yes, I believe God's word is truth. And I believe this word to be right. And I choose to embrace the truth that's communicated in this word. That's a significant thing. This is, this is very basic. If you want to understand God's word, interpret it, you gotta, you've got to make the determination, am I willing to submit to the worldview of Scripture, to what the, the Bible itself says is truth? Second is choosing to absorb the biblical worldview practically. And that's what I was just talking about a moment ago by hearing and reading and studying and memorizing and meditating on God's word. That's how you absorb God's word practically. It's daily being in the word. You can have a very high view of God's word. You can say, yes, I believe this is the word of God. And by the way, did you know the majority of the people who live in the United States of America believe this is the word of God? But if you don't do anything about that belief, it's really quite meaningless. It's the action that matters. It's actually reading this word that is important. It's being in the word of God that's transformative for us. So... Uh, First, if we want to let passages speak for themselves, we must immerse ourselves in the Bible. Second, by deriving our interpretation from the textual evidence. And so that's what I was talking about. And I want to contrast here two different ways to study. One is inductive and the other is deductive. Um, deductive starts with a thesis, then you seek to support it. And by the way, I would say the majority of people, when they go to the Bible, they come with a deductive mindset because a lot of times they have an ax to grind. They're like, well, I think this way. Let me see if I can find somewhere in Scripture that supports the way I think. That's deductive logic. You've already decided what you think is right. You're just looking for evidence to support your verdict. Inductive logic, instead, starts with the text then seeks to derive a thesis from the text. So again, if the interpretation comes to you too quickly, it's probably wrong, because you already had your thesis. If you really want to let the word speak for itself, then you let the text, the clues that you find in the text, the observations that we've already talked about, themes, repeated words, references, you observe the text, and then you derive from your observation and, and interpretation. You begin to form an idea. Okay, this is what it's talking about, and here's what it's saying about what it's talking about. So here's my interpretation. So you start with the text, then you seek a thesis, or you start with the passage, then you seek a thesis from the evidence. Um, how many of you like mysteries? Any of you read any mystery literature? Any of you ever read Father Brown? I like Father Brown. Father Brown... Uh, was written by G.K. Chesterton. Again, I like the classics, so this is like late 1800s probably. And uh, it's about a priest 
who is, it's basically an, uh, a, a priest version of Agatha Christie novels or something along those lines. Um, so it's mysteries, but it's this priest who's finding out, who's using clues, collecting clues to figure out what's going on. And, and all these great detectives, it's all about their observations, isn't it? If you look at all the detective stories, it's always all about their ability to read the clues, to gather the clues, to see them, to observe them, and then to make an interpretation based on what they induce. Now, again, we don't want to deduce. We don't want to walk in already determining, well, I know what happened, because then we're going to read the clues accordingly. By the way, I think this is amazing. How many people have been exonerated through DNA evidence? People who were convicted of crimes, but later on, DNA evidence, because it wasn't available then, comes to light, and they realize, no, they couldn't have done this crime. It's impossible. Then you say, well, how is it that a judge and a jury listened to all the arguments and came to the conclusion this person was guilty when they weren't guilty? Do you know how it is? Deduction. It's when we come with a conclusion already in our minds, and then we, we look for evidence to support our conclusion. You could also call it self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, but our goal when we're reading scripture is to let the context be our guide. We want to let God's context tell us what it means. And so let's look for a second at context and interpretation. Actually, I'm going to split all these great, I like to go past these, these are really neat, but it's a little too much for what we're doing tonight. Uh, so just ignore all that. Um, we gain contextual understanding by relating the text not to our previous experience, but by relating it to itself. I've been speaking of the importance of context, and this is really what it's all about. The point is that when you study the Bible, you need to focus not on archaeology, not on your imagination, not on your preconceived notions. You want to focus on the Word of God with this in mind, that we should not shape the text we should let the text shape us. All too often when we don't understand something in the Bible or when it conflicts with our beliefs, it's our natural tendency to try to make the Bible fit with what we think it should say. Isn't that the way it is? I mean, with everything in life, we want to try and interpret things through our grid, make it fit our grid. Um, but the Bible, if the Bible is written by God, then our goal is not to understand what I think about it. Our goal is to understand what God is saying in it. If it's God's word, then I want to understand God's word. That's my goal, is to understand what God is saying. So I let the Bible shape me. So let's get practical here. Um, let's practice some context and interpretation with 1 Peter 2.10. Actually, I forgot that I had this passage in here. Now, I've already referenced this, but 1 Peter chapter... To verse 10 is where we're going to camp for just a couple moments. And so 1 Peter 2, and we're going to start with verses 4 through 10. Actually, uh, let's start with 1 Peter 2, verse 10, um, just, and then we'll back up from there. So it says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Now, I've already told you what this means, but... Pretend I didn't. What does that mean? I mean, if you were reading this verse for the first time, would you think about the Old Testament or would you just go, hmm, okay, we're not a people, now we are a people. Okay, that's great, that's good. Um, initially, you might not see that. Now, let's take a moment just to read the whole passage in context. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 4 to 10, or actually, let me just explain it to you if I can. It reveals that believers are set apart from people in general as being special to God. If you just kind of boil it down, it's saying that those who belong to Jesus are special because of their relationship to Jesus. I'm not, it's not because I'm special that God chose me. It's because God chose me, that makes me special. And I'm special, I'm set apart as those who are loved by God, who belong to God's people. Um, that's the passage. This is the immediate passage. That's what it's talking about. Now we back out a little bit to the bigger context. And so what I'm trying to show you, and all those slides that I skipped, the basic point of them are this. 
that we start out with an immediate context, then we, we, we step back and we take a look at the context of the book as a whole, uh, because obviously Peter, if he's writing this book, He's going to say similar things or we're going to get an understanding of what he means by what he says, how he uses words elsewhere. And then we take a step back to the big picture of the entire story of God. So the point is there's different levels of context. The most important context is always the immediate context because that's where you're going to see the most clear communication of what he's trying to communicate. Um, Now, if we back up to the book, so from the passage... We read that he's talking about believers who are set apart from people in general as being special to God. Then you step back. The book as a whole, 1 Peter 2, 4 to 10 is a continuation of our call to holiness that you see in 1 Peter 1 and the beginning of 1 Peter 2. So in general, we see that the bigger message here is Peter saying that believers are called to be holy. That is set apart. They're unique. They're special because of their relationship to God. And they're to live in a unique way, in a way that's honoring to God. But then if you back out even more, you look at your cross-references. Now, does anyone have a Bible with cross-references that they're using right now? Anyone have a Bible that you're using that has cross-references? Look in the cross-reference section. When you look at verse 10, can you tell me what cross-references you have for that? From the Old Testament. I'll put that in there. Hosea. Hosea. And actually, if you back up even further to Hosea chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. So there's your cross-references. They're working for you. Because the, the, the author of, uh, I should say Peter, expects his audience to know when he makes these references that he's referring to Hosea and this Old Testament prophet where we read, Uh, Verse 9, then Yahweh said, call him Lo-Ami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Now, in the context, we're actually naming a child here. Uh, And you have to read the whole book of Hosea to to understand what all is going on. But basically, God uses the names of children to reflect what's happened with his people He's saying, you are my people, but you're not acting like my people anymore. So tell them they're not my people. That's the message. And also, we also see um, Lo Ruhama. Oh, that's earlier, verse 6. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call her Lo Ruhama. By the way, please don't ever name your daughter Lo Ruhama. Uh, That's that's not good Um, because it means not loved. Saying, ooh, we're no longer, you're no longer loved. And what's saying here is that because Israel stepped away from God, they're missing out on the blessings of being his people and being loved by him. But what Peter is saying, so now when you go back to Peter, go back to Peter, chapter 2, verse 10. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy And now you can see the beauty of what Peter is conveying. He's telling God's people, listen, there was a time when you were disciplined because you turned away from the faith. But guess what? That time is over. And now you've been received back. You're part of God's family. You are loved. You are my people. And so Peter's trying to impress upon the believers that he's writing to that, hey, you belong to God. You're loved by God. You're part of his people. And and he's saying, now live that way. Remember who you are and live that way. Live as a special people of God. But you don't really grasp all of that unless you know the context of the bigger, bigger biblical picture that's going on here. Now, not every passage has a reference that's so clear back to the Old Testament, but there are many that, that do and that are important. And so basically what we're saying here uh, is that uh, and I keep forgetting to put my points up here. The point of interpretation is to understand what the author is trying to communicate, avoiding our tendency to allow our own experiences to corrupt the true meaning of the passage. So we're looking for what the author is trying to say, and we're seeking to not allow our experiences to corrupt the true meaning of the passage. And then second point here, 
Such understanding looks to the immediate context, that's a passage, the context within a book, that's the bigger passage, uh, bigger context, and the context in the progression of the Bible story up to that point, the whole Bible. And again, this reflects very well what we've talked about. If you've been with us for the Story of God series, this is all... This all coheres with that concept that it's a bigger story. And so you need to understand God's word in the context of the bigger story. And the result of faithful interpretation is a deeper understanding of God and his word. And ultimately, this is what we're aiming at. We want to understand God and his word more clearly. We want to understand him. So that's why we try and read the, the Bible in context. Now let me pause here for another moment and ask, are there any questions or any of you who are joining us online, any questions? Uh, feel free to write them down. Dirk. It's, it's another Hebrew word for mercy or love. Or Yeah, Dirk is asking, Ruhama is different from Hesed and obviously... There are many different words for love uh, in the Bible. So a very significant Old Testament word for love is chesed, but this is a different one, ruhama. Other questions? All right. Well, we've covered the two biggest chunks, and we're going to go a little more quickly through the steps three and four. Um, so s step number three is principles. And I know this isn't a word, especially as you look to this. Let's see here. Do we have principalization? When's the last time you said that word? Um, it's not a word we use often, but it's the idea of taking something um, that's a specific interpretation and generalizing it to a, to a general principle. We'll see that in a second. So these, the steps in inductive Bible study, observe, interpret, principalize, apply. Um, and so principalization is the process by which one takes an interpretation of a biblical text and generalizes it so that it becomes an eternal, unchanging principle which can be applied to anyone. I should mention here that if you're doing the life on life studies, we use language that is a little simpler, but you're doing the same thing I'm describing here. I just, I just use different language. I think I say like, summarize what the passage is saying for interpretation. But it, th this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> so it's the same thing in your life on life studies. These, these principles all uh, translate over to the life on life studies. It will begin again a week from tomorrow in Ephesians. Um, so let me just try and differentiate these two things. Interpretation is uh, local Whereas principalization is going to be global. It's going to be for all places. Interpretation is situational. So it's focused on a specific situation. Uh, principalization is eternal. Let me just give really quickly a simple example of this. Um, if someone thinks of one, give it to me. Help me out here. I'm trying to think of something I can, that's, you can show the difference. Well... Let's uh, use the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Um, God gave this as a very as as a local. It was just for these people in the Middle East. God said, "On the Sabbath you shall you shall not work," and the Sabbath being the seventh day, which is Saturday. That's the Sabbath. Never work on that day. Uh, so if you translate that from this people in this local area of of Israel and say globally, what's the principle here? Um, or situationally, it's for this called apart people of God. They were a national people of God. It's different for us now. We're not a nation like Israel that was called set apart. We're among the nations. We're in the nations. Um, so the situational steps out to the more eternal. And so let me, let me take a little further here. Relating to a few, the specific Sabbath laws that says you can't work related to uh, uh, one people, but if you step that out and you say, what's the principle here? So let's say, and I believe the principle communicated in Sabbath is that we all need rest from a spiritual point of view, that it's healthy to have a rhythm of rest in life, to be able to set aside time to, to think on the things of God, to grow with his people. So if that's the more general principle, 
that means no longer for them, it was specific, you can't do any work. And you know that, for example, uh, Jewish people who are Orthodox, they, they won't even flip on a light switch because that's considered work. But whereas there was a situational and specific application for them, for us, there's a more general principle of it's good for us on a weekly basis to have time set aside to be in God's presence, to be with his people, to, um, to contemplate the things of God. So this is the general principle. So this is what we're doing. We're, when we move from an interpretation that's more specific, we're moving to something more general. In general, we need rest. Uh, what the text meant is what our goal is in interpretation. So a lot of times we'll speak in the past tense. So I'll say, God told Israel that they cannot work on the Sabbath. That's past tense. What, what it means, God encourages all people who love him to set aside time to be in his presence every week. That would be present tense as opposed to, that's uh, usually principles going to be written in the, in the present tense. Um, and so let's take Genesis 40 as an example because um, a lot of these things, you just need examples of what we're talking about. So let's turn to Genesis 40 for a second. And you may remember the story. Let me actually just give you the next slide here. So Genesis 40 interpreted. Through the interpretation of the cupbearer and the baker's dreams, Joseph reveals that even though he was imprisoned, he is still trusting in God, and God reveals that he is still working through Joseph and blessing him. So let me just set the stage here. You remember Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. They said, we don't like you. We know dad likes you better than us, so go away. So they sell him into slavery. He goes to Egypt. He gets wrongly accused of something in Potiphar's house. He gets put in prison. So here's this man doubly unjustly treated, unjustly sold into slavery, unjustly imprisoned. And while he's in prison... He has the privilege of being a mouthpiece for God. These individuals have dreams, and he is given the ability by God to interpret their dreams. And so through the interpretations of the cupbearer, that's one of the individuals. He was a cupbearer to the king, and the other's the baker to the king. Do you remember which one had the, had the, had the worst lot of the two? Anyone? The baker. Yeah, what, what Joseph had to say was the cupbearer was, was relatively positive. Hey, you're going to be brought back in. The baker, it was lights out. Um, but Joseph reveals that even though he has been in prison, he is still trusting in God, and God reveals that he's still working through Joseph. So here's an interpretation of Genesis 40. I'm not saying it's the interpretation, but it's just an example of what an interpretation would look like. Now, let's take that interpretation and principalize it. Those who trust in God, even in the midst of trials, will find God to be faithful and good. Do you see the difference between those two? The one is local, it's situational, it's related to specific people, the cupbearer, to the baker, to Joseph. It's specific, it's what the text meant. The principle here is global, it applies to all people, all times, it's eternal. This is always true, that those who trust in God... Even in the midst of trials, we'll find God to be faithful and good. And it's a general truth that all can apply to their life. It's what's it, what the text means. So do you get the difference between interpretation and principalization? Is you're just generalizing what you interpreted from the passage of Scripture. All right. We're ready to move on to the final step of studying the Bible, and that is application this is a step that too often is ignored, <laughs> passed over. We go, oh, well, now I know what it means. That's great. Oh, that's deep. That's deep thought. So now I can tell people about it in Bible study because I now understand God's word. That's not the goal of God's word, right? The goal of interpreting, observing, interpreting, and principalizing God's word is not so that you have the right answers in Sunday school. What's the goal? It's so that you apply it to your life and that you live in greater obedience to the word of God, that it transforms you. That's the goal of scripture is to transform us. And so step number four, application. Application is the fourth step in the studying the Bible. Observe, interpret, principalize, apply. Specifically in the process, it is the process by which an eternal principle is specifically and personally applied to an individual's life. 
How should I change the way I am presently living in light of God's message in this specific passage of Scripture? That's the question you're asking. How should I change the way I am living because of what I have read? Now, sometimes it's not necessarily going to mean go out and do something. You may not go out and do something as an application. It could be think this way and not that way. That could be an application. It could be stop thinking that you're not loved by God. If you're reading 1 Peter, no, you are my people. You are loved. I love you. I care for you. So stop. If you have, if you have thought patterns that say, no, God doesn't love me. I don't belong to him. Then stop those and replace them. Whenever those thoughts come into your mind, begin thinking instead, wait a second. I remember what I read in 1 Peter 2.10. That God does love me, and I do belong to him. I'm part of his people. So it needs to be personal and specific. And I was just reading this week, it just happens to be that uh, in, our, in my discipleship group, we're reading The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges, speaking of classics. And he talks about this specific thing when he's talking about application. He says the most important part of this process, that is Bible study, is the specific application of the scripture to specific life situations. We are prone to vagueness at this point. When it comes to application, we are prone to vagueness, aren't we? Let's just pause for a second. If you're reading a passage that tells you you should love everyone, it's easy for your application to say, I'm gonna work harder on loving everyone. Do you know what's harder? I'm going to work harder on loving Joe who works down at the grocery store who I see and he just irritates me. But I'm going to work harder on treating him in a loving manner. That is a lot harder to do, isn't it? I'd rather be vague because then I don't have to feel convicted, <laughs> right? So we all kind of lean towards vagueness when it comes to interpretation. But if you want to grow, you take God's word and you say, okay, God, where in my life Am I not loving someone the way that you've described? Oh, yeah, Joe. Okay, what can I do, God? And maybe you think of specific things you can do. You know, next time I see Joe, he's, uh, he's always asking me to help him with this thing, and I don't want to. But, you know, next time he asks, I'm going to say, in fact, I'm going to, he doesn't even ask. I'm going to say, hey, Joe, you've mentioned that thing. How could I help you with that? That'd be a personal, specific application. Okay, we continue with what Jerry Bridges is saying. We are prone to vagueness at this point because commitment to specific action makes us uncomfortable. But we must avoid general commitments to obedience and instead aim for specific obedience in specific instances. We deceive our souls when we grow in knowledge of the truth without specifically responding to it. And he references here James 1.22. Do you remember that passage where James says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. The person who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a person who looks at his face in a mirror and immediately after he walks away forgets what he looks like. Well, that'd be weird, wouldn't it? If you walk up to someone and say, hey, do I have blue eyes? Is my hair brown? Do I have a beard? Because I don't remember what I look like. No, that would be, that'd be silly, right? Because you look at yourself in the mirror, you know what you look like. And he's saying that instead of just looking into God's word, we need to apply it to our lives because that's where blessing comes, is when you not just listen to it, you do what it says. And so this is the necessary step in Bible study that we often think is not necessary. It is absolutely necessary for us. And so this is our application, James. Uh, until we answer the question, so what, we have not fully understood the passage. Do you agree with that? Until you've actually stopped to say, okay, God, how does this apply to my life? You don't really understand the passage yet. Because the passage is only understood when we apply it to our lives. All right, I want to, so basically here's our goal. We have God's word. And we have our lives. And the two are, you know, right? If, if I just put this word here, it's going to do nothing for me. It's going to have no impact on my life. So how do I get this book into me? How do I let God's word transform me? 
First of all, I engage with Scripture by, as we mentioned already, observation. So we carefully read the text to understand, to see what it says, to look for clues, repeated words, themes, references. Second, interpretation is I take all my themes that I've spent time writing out and saying, okay, this, these are the words that are repeated, this is the significant themes. Now, let me take these words and form them into an idea, an interpretation that's based on these themes. And by the way, again, you can always check your interpretation by going back to the words that you wrote down. If you come up with an interpretation that doesn't look like those words, there's something wrong with your interpretation because those are the clues you're supposed to base it off of. When you have your interpretation, what it meant in the past, you want to say, okay, now how does it apply for all people at all time? What's the eternal principle that is present in this passage? What the text means for all people, for all times? And then finally, so what? Application. How does this apply to my life? When you have completed this entire process, then you can say you've studied a passage. But it's got to start by hearing what the text says, and it's got to conclude by saying, okay, God, what do you want me to do in response to what I've read? Now, one more time. Any questions? Any questions on this process? Here's the thing I will tell you. You know, I present this seminar in more of a lecture format, and I use some words that maybe you're not always as familiar with that you don't use in everyday life. But really, if you go to our Life on Life page, and by the way, let me put that up. Oh, maybe I didn't put, I thought I put a slide there. I didn't, it's not there. That's okay. Um, if you go to our website and you look under Life on Life, you'll see our new study that's on Ephesians. And you'll, if you look down below there, you're going to see underneath that study some of the basic questions we use. And so it may sound a little complex, but all you're doing is you're sitting down, you're carefully reading God's word, you're taking those observations that you've made in your careful reading to summarize what it's saying, what it meant for those to whom it was originally written, and then you're taking that interpretation and you're translating it, what is, what is the principle that underlies this for all people of all time, and then how do I apply it to my life? It's really a simple process, and I love to tell this story. I've told this many times. I have a plaque on my wall, a framed prose uh, piece, and it's words that were written by, uh, a, well, he was a young man back then, and so was I, um, a man who came to Christ when we were in Minnesota. He came, oh, thank you, Ernest, yeah a man who came to faith in Christ while we were in Minnesota. And uh, I've shared this, I've shared about him before. He didn't have uh, a significant background in uh, church. Um, his family wasn't the most churched family. Um, and yet here's the funny thing. When he went through this training with me, and then he joined a small group that I was in. And what impressed me is how closely aligned his interpretations were with what I came up with. Me, who had been through Bible college and seminary, maybe I wasted my money. No, I don't believe that. But the point is, anyone can read, can study the Word of God and understand what it means and let it transform them if you're willing to put in the effort. And so here's my challenge to you. If you're not already do doing this, at least once a week, study the Word. Saying so you may not say, so my, my expectation is you're reading it every day, by the way. So this is my thought, is that every single day you're hearing or at least reading God's word. So you may be reading through, let's say I'm reading through the gospel of John, but maybe I've decided I'm studying the Psalms. So I'll, I'll start on Psalm 1 and I'll do the whole Psalm and I'll be studying it, doing these things. And by the way, you can do this in multiple sittings. I usually don't do this whole process in one sitting. It's even better if you can do it in multiple sittings. 
because then you're kind of ruminating on it. So do your observations the first day, and then maybe the next day, go back to those observations, reread the passage again, and see if you can boil it down to an interpretation. And then you can work your principle. But my point is, at least on a weekly basis, be studying a passage. Go beyond reading to actually studying a passage at a more in-depth level, at least once a week. Make that part of your habit. Grow that. Maybe you'll pick a specific day that you'll be doing more Bible study, or maybe you're just working through specific passages in the Bible. By the way, I have passage breakdowns for a lot of, pa- a lot of the books of the Bible. So if you're saying, I want to do my own study through this book, but I don't know how to figure out which passages to break it down into. I can help with that. I'd be happy to pass along if I have something for you. And I've also created breakdowns for people when they've asked. Um, but be studying God's word. Okay, here's the, the easiest way to apply what we're talking about tonight is to join one of our Life on Life groups because they're following this exact same process. They start one week from tomorrow uh, Keith has been receiving. Uh, People have been signing up. They've been filling out the little slips that were here today. They're going to be in the bulletin next Sunday too. He's been probably getting emails as well from people who've been in Life on Life before. And they've been saying, yes, please sign me up. And what we'll do uh, next Sunday, we'll probably look over, or probably this week sometime, and then again on Sunday, we'll look over everyone who's signed up, and we'll seek to connect people in a group that we think is a good fit for them. And we have groups of three or four ladies, groups of three or four guys. Some are meeting in person. Some are meeting uh, virtually via live stream or via Zoom. Zoom. Uh, So, you know, you can actually put on your sign up, and that's something we need to include is whether you want to meet in person or you prefer to meet uh, via Zoom because that might dictate as well who you're meeting with. But all we're doing is exactly what we're talking about. And it's getting together every two weeks because every week you have a study and then every two weeks you do the two studies that you've done in those previous two weeks. You get together with your group and you talk through it. You go, okay, well, here were my interpretations. Here's my interpretation of this passage. What's yours? And you can chat about it and you can speak truth into each other's lives. It's a very easy way to put into practice what we're talking about tonight. Okay, one more opportunity. Any questions before we close? Thank you for coming tonight. It's been good to review these important principles, and I'm glad you were able to join us, both you who are here in person and those of you who joined us via live stream. We're grateful you're with us. Let's close our time in prayer. And God, we just thank you for the richness of your word and the the fact that we have the privilege of studying your word, of learning from you, of letting your story become our story. God, we want more of your story in our lives. We want to prioritize our nutritional intake of your word on a daily basis as we read it, on a weekly basis as we hear it with the gathered people of God, and as we take opportunities to study it. God, we want your word to saturate us because we believe that your word is truth. Please lead in each of our lives. Help us to more uh, diligently engage with your word on a regular basis so it might do its work of transformation by the power of your spirit. We pray it in Christ's precious name. Amen.